So I am adding RISC-V assembly language to a class that I teach. And so in this screencast, I just wanted to document some of the steps that it took for me to get a good working RISC-V assembly language environment and, and a few things that I figured out along the way. So the first steps are actually installing um, a cross-compiler and cross-assembler environment. And uh, I'm actually setting all this up on a Raspberry Pi. So I'm running Raspberry Pi as a server that students connect to and use for doing their homework, and it will run simulated, a simulated RISC-V environment. So the first thing to go is to the RISC-V Collab um, user on GitHub in the RISC-V GNU tool chain, and it actually has pretty clear instructions that worked. Uh, it was very straightforward. So run this command to clone the repository. Uh, you'll need a bunch of disk space. It's pretty, uh, pretty big. I'm running Raspberry Pi OS, uh, the 64-bit version, but, um, but I just copied and pasted this command since it's a Debian-based system, and that installed all the uh, required uh, tools. And then I ran, uh, let's see, I decided to install it in their suggested location of opt risk 5 So right before running this command here, I just created a directory uh, slash opt slash, slash risk 5 I changed it uh, its owner to be me, rusross.rusross, .rusross. Uh, and then ran this configure command, followed by this make command, and then I walked away and let it run overnight. I think it takes a couple of hours on a Raspberry Pi to build everything. But that builds it and installs it. Um, so the next step was to make sure that that was all in my path. So what it does is it introduces um, versions of the basic compiler suite all with this prefix, risk 564 hyphen unknown hyphen elf hyphen, like dash as is the assembler, GCC is the compiler, and so forth. So I wanted that to be uh, not only in my path, but since students will be connecting to this machine and working, I wanted to make sure it was in everybody's path. So I added it into Etsy profile. This line right here is the one that I modified, and you can see at the very end of that, I've added opt risk 5 bin to the path. Um, profile is normally only loaded for a login session, so to activate it, I then had to log out and log back in. If you're just doing it for yourself, you can also just put it in your own home directory .profile, um, or your bash IC, RC, or wherever it is that you like to add things to your path. But that way, I got it system wide for all my students. I also wanted to make sure that Vim was set up uh, to give kind of a nice good default experience. So um, I went on GitHub and found Kyle Laker's RISC-V syntax rules for Vim. So um, that's here, Kyle Laker slash RISC-V.Vim. Went into the syntax directory and I just copied this file. And then I also copied and slightly modified his FT detect, his file type detection file here. And I'll just show you, again, I wanted them to be installed system-wide, so instead of putting them in my own uh, .vim directory, I put them in, uh, let's see, I'll show you, um, var lib, I had to create the vim add-ons and uh, syntax directories, so that's where the syntax rules went. And then I'll go ahead and cat var lib vim add-ons ft detect risc5.vim. Here's the one that I actually installed. So this looks for .s and both capital and lowercase. Installs a good default color scheme um, and sets the file type. I turn on expand tab and set my tab size and shift width sizes both to four. Those are good default student uh, settings for my students. Um, and again, those could go in your home directory in your own private .vim directory uh, in the syntax and ft detect. Um, directories if, if you just want to set it for yourself, but I wanted it system-wide. So that worked well. So then let me show, here's a little Hello World project. Um, so file is called start.s. Uh, I prefer to do things with no C compiler involvement at all, no standard library, really want to go pretty raw. And so um, one thing that means is using .s as the extension with a lowercase. If you do .s with a capital S, uh, it runs the C pre-compiler first before running the assembler. Um, and then I invoke the assembler and linker directly. I don't use GCC. I'll show you that in a moment. 
So I set up um, the entry point for the program defaults to underscore start. So that is the label that uh, where things get running. I define a few constants. I define a couple strings in the data segment, switch over to the text segment, and then just ran a couple write system calls. So here's the first one. I load um, standard, in, standard out, which is just one into A0. The address, I use the LA pseudo instruction to load the address of this string into A1. I have the assembler compute the length of that string and I load that into A2. Then I load the system call number into A7 and I just went and looked these up, uh, 64 for the right system call. And E call, uh, which is short for environment call, that's how you invoke a system call in Risk v And then I do the same thing again for a second string and then I do an exit system call. So this is my hello world program. Uh, and when I was playing around with this in a few variants, it worked sometimes, but not other times. Some of the writes would work and others wouldn't. So one thing I wanted to document is how I eventually tracked that down and what it fixed it. So let me just show you the make rules that I came up with for building. So for the assembler, here's what I run. So again, all those prefixed instructions. So that's the assembler name. I turn on debugging information, optimize for GDB. I ask the assembler to give me all warnings and make them all for fatal. Um, if I don't do that, students routinely ignore any warnings that come up, and that helps catch some problems. I also went ahead and told the assembler to assume that the architecture is RISC-V 64 with I, M, and D. I is the base inst integer instruction set, M adds multiply and divide instructions, and D adds double precision floats. Um, I'm only using I and M right now, but uh, it insisted the assembler is unhappy if you leave off D. Um, I basically wanted to make sure that the assembler wasn't getting creative and using any, you know, that I know where I'm getting any kind of uh, exotic instructions or extensions. Uh, one of my goals is to have the students actually write a simulator, and so I want to, uh, for Risk Five, and so I want to make sure everything's kept to a very simple subset. And then here's the one that fixed my problem, uh, minus M, no relax. By default, uh, it has these uh, relaxation rules for the linker, where some of those LA, uh, the load address pseudo instructions, uh, assume that you have GP, the global pointer, one of the registers, set to a position in the data segment, and they're able to turn LA pseudo instructions instead of expanding them into two real instructions they can sometimes expand it into just or just substitute one real instruction. Now I didn't want it being clever, I don't want my students to have to set that up, and so by saying minus m no relax, it just suspends that and, and does things the, the two instruction way every time, which is, is what I want. Um, then I run the linker, ld, so I have, my, I have it output my file to just a dot .o object file. With the linker, I also have it turn on fatal warnings. Otherwise, if it can't resolve a symbol, sometimes it just treats that as a warning and students get mystified when it, the code doesn't, doesn't run. Um, so now I can run, let's see, risk five. Uh, it also has a simulator built into the uh, compiler suite. And I can tell it to run it, and it does, and everything works great. Um, here, I'll just show you. Um, I'll disassemble that. Oops. Oh, minus D. Let me clear the screen. So here's what it actually assembled. And here's where, so I had load standard in um, into A0. And here are the two instructions that are generated uh, in place of that LA instruction. So anyway, that was something that took me a while to figure out because it was just loading incorrect addresses uh, when I used the LA pseudo instruction. Here's a slightly more complex project. It's a Sudoku solver. Um, let me just go ahead and build it. So you can see this has a handful of different uh, source files. Uh, they're all compiled or assembled independently and then linked together as the last step. Um, and with this, I wanted to show, um, let's see. So what this does is it has you type in a Sudoku board. Here's one I, I have prepared, um, dot, represent unsolved squares, digits one through nine represent solved squares. I just copied this one from a Sudoku website. And that's just all 81 positions in a row. Now if I run the, the simulator, type in this board, this uh, program as it stands right now does two things. First it calculates the pencil marks um, and then prints the board. 
and then it goes through and runs some solving steps and prints the board again when it's finished. As you can see, that took a long time. That was a very slow process for what is ultimately some pretty straightforward code. Um, a lot of steps, but it should happen much faster than that. So I found it very helpful to install the Q QMU user package. I already have it installed, so it's not going to do anything right now. But that gives me the QMU simulator, which is much faster. Um, and so I can say run a RISC-5 64 simulator for A dot out. And now when I paste the same input, you can see it jumps right to the solution. It's, it's just a much faster emulator. Um, it also kind of surprised me the first time I discovered that I could now just run, um, let's see if I ask the type of A dot out, you can see it is in fact a RISC-V binary, uh, but I can run it directly. Um, and that package, um, that QMU user package, uh, sets up, a, a, intercepts, uh, attempts to run RISC-V binaries and, and runs them through the emulator. So they almost appear to be native, native binaries. You still need to run the special RISC-V version of GDB and, and so forth. Um, so a couple other things I did. One was to make debugging friendly for students. So I have a rule. Uh, well, I have, uh, I guess I don't need that. Um, so if I run um, the, the RISC-V version of GDB, trained on a dot out, I have it set to jump right to this display, which shows the contents of all the registers, the um, source code surrounding the line that's being executed, and has room for a few others. And so this is a, a great project I discovered a while back on uh, the GDB dashboard by Cyrus End. And um, it takes the form of just a .gdb init file that is mostly written in Python and gives you these different segments. And so every time you step line by line, it just re refreshes the entire screen with that, that information. So it doesn't require any special terminal setup. Um, it seems to be pretty widely compatible, pretty simple. They're still just using GDB, but they get a little more information on screen. It's a little more of a visual debugger. And that seems to be really helpful. Um, I copied it into my um, so I, I distribute that with my projects. I added a, just a couple extra startup sets, uh, steps. One was to reintroduce an alias that used to be there in older versions to be able to control it using DB instead of deep dashboard. I added this to set the initial screens that I want. I didn't like the, the set of things it was uh, displaying. And then this is kind of to, to get things going a little easier. Uh, GDB has a built-in simulator for RISC-V, and so I want to use that to run the code. Um, so it, normally when you launch GDB, you would type target sim, so I have it automatically run that, followed by load to load the code, and then start i just kicks the process off, starts it, and pauses on the first instruction. And so that causes the dashboard to display everything. So again, if I run that, here's what the students see initially, and they're on the first instruction in my underscore start. Um, now, one last thing, uh, if I run that and tell it to continue, so it runs at full speed, I type in the board, you can see that this is using the slow simulator, which for my purposes is actually fine. Most of the assembly language we're writing is not all that intensive and it's fine for students to, <laughs> they, they can wait. <laughs> um, but uh, if you do want to use the faster simulator, you can also run QMU, uh, RISC-V, 64, if you ask it for options. Uh, you can tell it to wait for a GDB connection on a port, and then in a separate window go and run, launch GDB and point it at that port as the target and debug remotely, and then you get the faster simulator, which, which can be nicer. So uh, a couple nice options there, but I was pleased to see that GDB includes a simulator that works pretty well um, and makes everything very simple. And then that QMU uh, simulator is, is a much faster and kind of nicer version to use. But with that, I'm up to the point where I can write assembly language, um, found you know, the good, some, some good build rules, a uh, good simulation environment, a good debugging environment. Again, I'm running this on a Raspberry Pi, but it should the installation steps should be almost identical for any De Debian-based system. So it's a pretty good way to go. I hope to get some real hardware in the next year or two. Um, but for now, um, that's what I am using.
using to get my students up and running on RISC-V assembly language.